ever been walking out in the woods, you know, out in nature, and you see this big, beautiful tree, and, you know, in all its glory, and you look at it, and you're thinking to yourself, how the hell have you done it? How the hell have you survived for all these years, grown so big and beautiful, and not one human being has been by here to help you? Not one guy with his backpack sprayer or a handful of fertilizer has come by to nurse you along. And on the other side, we have humanity and all of our advancements, all of our technology, and we've even gone as far as to alter organisms. And we grow plants on average for about three months, and we fail miserably. I mean, we have to spoon feed these plants constantly, and we have to spray off the insects to keep them alive in order to get them to market. And, uh, you know, this is about where I was. It's the summer of 2008, and um, at the time I was working for the Breakers Hotel and Resort in Palm Beach, I was growing some things for the chefs, doing some microgreens, some salads, some herbs, and different things. I was just messing around. And uh, we were also recycling a lot of food scraps out of the kitchen, and I was turning them into uh, compost, you know, to grow our stuff. And what we noticed is all the stuff that I was growing tastes better than anything that we could buy. And, uh, you know, we wanted to learn more about it. And uh, they sent me out to California, to the Napa and Sonoma Valleys, to research some restaurants that were either growing their own food or had aligned with farms to grow food for them. And this trip led me to Chez Panisse. And uh, if you guys don't know, Chez Panisse is the restaurant of Alice Waters. And back in the early 70s, she started the slow food movement by demanding local and organic produce. So, you know, I had the honor of meeting Alice and uh, she pushed me along to her chefs. I got a tour of the restaurant and, you know, got to see behind the scenes. It was so cool. And then they got their farmer on the phone. And Bob Kennard has been farming for Alice for over 30 years. And, uh, you know, I'm on the phone with him, and you got to imagine this. This is the rookie talking to the Hall of Famer. And I got lots of questions for him. So I started asking, and he said, you yeah, know, hold on. I'm going to be at a farm in Sonoma. Why don't you meet me over there? And I'll talk to you all about it. So um, he gives me the address. I punch it in my navigator. from Berkeley to Sonoma I go. And uh, the address he gave me led me right to downtown Sonoma. And, you know, I passed Town Square, I passed the City Hall, shopping, houses, all that sort of stuff. And, and along the way, I passed lots of farms, but I couldn't find this one. And I called him up and I said, hey, I'm, I'm lost, Bob. And I described where I was, and he said, oh, no, you're here. It's two gates up on the left. And he welcomed me, met me at the gate and welcomed me there. And as I'm looking at it, it, it wasn't at all what I imagined I'd see. You know, it's right in this urban setting. And... Um, it was, it was, in fact, it was a big, beautiful house, plantation-style house. It turns out the house was his partner's house, Fred Klein. And Fred Klein's a wine grape grower in Northern California. Um, grows under the brands Klein Cellars and Jacuzzi. And, you know, we walk on and he starts talking to me and I'm scanning the area and I don't see anything that I really recognize. You know, I'm looking, really looking hard here and, and I see like overgrown weeds. I see uh, maybe cover crops, things like that. And, you know, we're talking and we get up a little closer and I spy amidst the weeds this romaine head, uh, 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 head of romaine lettuce like I've never seen. And I look down the row and I see more of them. And I say, Bob, wait, what's going on here? Can you explain this? I've never seen anything like it. You know, I'm used to clean cultivation, no weeds, nothing like that. And uh, he said, yeah, on all our farms we grow two plants, one for nature and one for humanity. And it is, uh, weeds are, we consider nature support crops and they help our crops grow. And, and you know, at the time this kind of, this made sense to me because I had just learned that, you know, fo through photosynthesis, plants produce sugars, right? And 30 to 50 percent of those sugars are exuded through the roots to attract the soil biology to help further feed the plant, break down organic matter. And, you know, in theory, having a lot of plants together kind of makes sense. They help each other. So he continued, and we walked up a little bit further, and I'll never forget this. There was a clearing in the soil, and he pulls out his pocket knife, and he starts to draw this diagram in the soil, and he says, he says there's four things that a plant needs to grow. And this hit me like a freight train, because I was studying organics at the time, and I was so frustrated because, you know, it's, it's very chemistry-based. We were applying safer chemicals at certain times. You know, this one it flowers, this one it fruits, this if you want root production. And we were still robbing one land to feed another. And how, why were we struggling so much? And that tree did it so effortlessly. So I was all ears. He started drawing and he drew this circle. And in the circle, he drew a plus sign. And it divided this circle into four equal quadrants. And in the top left quadrant, he wrote the letter D. And he said D stands for digestion. And this is 
this is not much different than your digestive system and your process. You know, you have three to five pounds of, of microbiology in your stomach, and you better hope it's all the good guys or else you're going to be sick. And this is no different for the plant. And if you, on an acre of farmland, you've got over 1,500 to 2,000 pounds of microbiology under the ground. You better hope they're all good, too, because your plant's not going to grow well. So in the next quadrant over, he wrote letter R. And R stands for the rock element. And this stands for the minerals that the plant needs to grow. And it's through mineral absorption that the plant produces secondary metabolites and can protect itself. You know, a plant can't get up and run from a predator. It can't put on sunscreen. It can't duck in the shade when it's too hot. It's there, it's naked, and it's got to take whatever Mother Nature gives it. So it's very important to have those minerals there. And then the next quadrant underneath the D, he wrote letter A. And he said A stands for all the air side elements. And these are the gases, the nitrogen, the oxygen, the carbon dioxide. And water is included in this. And then the last column, he wrote letter L. And he, stands, he says it stands for the light element. And this isn't just the sunlight, but it's the moonlight. It's also starlight and cosmic light. There's a lot there that we don't understand, but they're all very important. If you were to take a seed now and plant it in the middle of those crosshairs, right in the middle, and as that air side element water interacts with the seed and the digestion of the soil, that seed germinates, that magic happens, right? And the roots will populate the soil, and they'll go down, and they'll interact with the minerals. And as the plant go, uh, pops up, you're going to get the cotyledons, the first leaves that come up, and then you're going to have the true leaves, and then you're photosynthesizing, and we're, you know, we're in business. The plant's growing. And if you have all four of those balanced perfectly, the plant's going to grow perfectly. You're not going to get insects. And the end product that you taste off that, you won't soon forget. It's going to be perfectly balanced and healthy. See, nature has these mechanisms in place. If it tastes good, it's, it's good for you. And um, insects uh, aren't, uh, aren't going to attack that plant that's grown in this way, that has been able to produce these secondary metabolites. It's going to be perfectly healthy. And, and Bob called insects uh, mercenaries of nature to come put the sick and wounded plant out of its misery. And uh, I, I think of them more as indicators of, of the plant's health and more of a symptom. You know, if you're coughing and sneezing, you don't say, hey, I got a cough and a sneeze. You're like, I got a cold or allergies or something like that. And uh, insects are more of a symptom. And I explain, the, like, for, if you were to put down a nitrogen fertilizer, like cow manure, you know, we're all organic, so we're putting down cow manure, and it's a great soil amendment, but if you don't balance it with minerals, what happens is the plant has to soak up extra water to dilute that nitrogen so you get cell expansion. And it's weak soft tissue growth, and you're going to get aphids. And then if you were to go to the uh, light side element, and you were to plant a tomato plant where it doesn't get enough sun, you're going to get white fly. The plant's going to stretch, it's going to be soft tissue, and then they come to take it out. And, um, you know, you can use this, a similar type of philosophy when you're scanning the land and looking at soil as a whole. And the weeds can also be considered indicators of the soil's health. And say you have a calcium deficient soil, there's going to be some sort of plant that really grows well in that soil. And it doesn't need very much calcium to live, and what's going to happen is it's going to soak up that little calcium, and through its lifetime, it's going to put it throughout its body. And it's going to grow up and die of old age, and all that calcium, when it dies, is going to get released back to the soil. And over time, the soil will build, and it will change, and soon you'll have a new pioneer species that's going to come in and take that one's place. And it's this philosophy and thought process, the natural process, that I grasp and I got, I, I, I really um, connected with it. And I had to go back and learn more. I decided then and there that I wanted to be a farmer and I wanted to grow a lot of, a lot of food for a lot of people and make them really healthy and make the world, the earth healthier at the same time. So I went back there um, a year later and I spent, I did an internship on Bob's farm. It's called Green String Farm. And during that, that summer, I wasn't expecting to happen what happened to me. I was totally romanced and engulfed by this local food system and this community. Um, we had to work the farmers markets when we were there and I, I would watch the other, and it was all farmers, I don't know, you don't see many of those like that here um, to where you actually meet the farmers and uh, there was no wholesalers there. There were, You got to really meet the people that were growing the food and I would watch the interaction with the people and they were, there was a sense of pride and um, care and ownership of what they were growing. They cared, they, they were excited to hear how you liked last week's harvest, and then they were also excited to tell you about what's coming. 
And then a lot of the people that I interacted with, the people that were shopping, the community people, um, a lot of them kept gardens themselves. And it wasn't uncommon to hear a tale of a tomato that they were growing or perhaps a um, strand of basil that they had a seed of that was passed down through their family through generations and it was a direct reflection of their ethnicity and their heritage and culture and it was beautiful. And uh, the kids were learning at a young age and the schools, Alice Waters has a program called the Edible Schoolyard where she teaches kids respect at a young age for food, how to prepare it, how to grow it, and how to return it to the earth. And all the, all the restaurants that picked up from the farm, the, the rule was is you had to return last week's harvest, whatever you didn't use, the remnants, the choppings, anything, you had to return them to the farm so we could put them back in the soil. So it was a totally different way of life than I was used to, and I'd lay awake at night and I would dream up what I had to come back and do. I said, you can't just go back and, and farm. You got, I want this for my area. I want a local food system. I want my kid to grow up knowing about food and how to grow it and, and, and have respect for it. So I came back and obviously I started a farm and I connected with, with restaurants immediately and chefs and I got that taken care of. And then I started helping people grow in their backyard. And, Today I have over 15 things that I make from cedar to uh, help people in a urban setting grow food. And I started a program for kids called Farmer Jay's Junior Sprouts, and I also teach adults. I have uh, eight different classes that I take to the schools and teach them about agriculture to reconnect them with food. And the last thing is, is composting. Of course, it's, it's very important to recycle. So just like they did in California. I'm, I'm also collecting all the re restaurants that I deliver to. I have to take back the scraps as well. I'm also taking responsibility for other farmers and recycling theirs as well. Started with Whole Foods in Boca, and I'm recycling up to 3,000 pounds a week and turning it into soil. And I hope one day to be able to offer compost to other gardeners and farmers one day. Um, I think that, you know, just by changing the way we farm and eat, we're going to solve all of our big problems. And if you think for a second, the three main things that affect us today, and, and not in any particular order, but water, petroleum, and healthcare, right? And uh, agriculture is the biggest hog of water. Over 70% of our water goes to agriculture. And because of our practices, it's all wasted. We don't build soil, so all of our water is mostly <coughs> wasted. So it, it affects us big time when we have droughts. And the petroleum issue, our tractors go up and down the field numerous times. Sometimes I think that the, the farmers are just wanting to exercise them or something because they go so many times up and down. The fertilizers that we're using are petroleum based, not to mention the manufacturing process that we use to make them. And then we harvest our produce and on average it goes 1,500 miles before it gets to the end user. So we can drastically cut down our petroleum use if we localize our food systems and uh, these smaller diversified farms we're not using as much. Then we, you know, just, just by changing those things, I think we can solve a lot. And then lastly, our health care, you know, it's sad. I, I don't know anybody today that's not touched by cancer in some way. You know, over 1.6 million people will be diagnosed with cancer this year, and of that, 580,000 are going to die. And cancer is now the leading cause of death in our youth, kids 15 and under. And this is a big problem to me because I think that it's all, you know, could be changed with food. In fact, I know a lot of people that have changed the direction of cancer with food just by eating properly. So we can solve all those problems just by doing that. And if we look back in our history in the early 1900s, 70% of us kept a garden. And today that's 1%. We've totally detached ourselves from agriculture. The kids now, they think produce comes from the grocery store. You know, they don't have any contact or connection with the farm, and it's, it's so unfortunate. And, you know, this, this needs to change. So what I, what I propose is everybody to grow something. And if you think about it, if we go back to that 70% number with our population today, we have over 319 million people in the United States. 70% of us start a garden. That's over 200 million gardens. And... I'm sorry, that'll, that's a local food system there. You're going to be able to supply food. You're going to be able to supply food for yourself, your family, your friends, and everybody shares. It's, it's, it's wonderful. 
You know, so I propose everybody grow something, everybody get a garden going in some way and reconnect with the land. And I want to leave you guys with, with one thought, and you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit because I didn't bring my slides on this. So I want you to imagine a globe, and this is a model of the Earth. And on this model, you can see all the continents and countries on it. And you can also see the population. And for every 100,000 people, you're going to see an orange dot come up. So if you're looking at it today, it looks like blobs all over, all along the coastline, connecting lands all over. But if you were to start it from the beginning of time, and you watch it in time lapse, you're going to see orange dot pop up, orange dot, and then faster and faster, and then all to where we are today. And you know, moving forward, they say we're going to need, by 2050, we're going to need 70% more uh, food production to survive the, the population. So anyways, you see this map being overtaken by the orange dots. Now, I want you to imagine an orange, just a piece of fruit. And we're going to inoculate this orange with a mold spore. And through time lapse on this one, now you're going to watch the mold populate the orange and eventually overtake it until there's no orange left, and then the mold's going to die. And my question to you is, are we smarter than mold? <laughs> are, we, are we going to watch it? Are we, going to, are we going to, just going to take it all until there's nothing, and then we wonder where to go? Anyways, I encourage you all to grow something, keep a garden, and recruit people to grow something. Thank you. Thank you.